No one who has been paying attention to the growth of radical Islam in Britain should have been surprised that the terrorist who stood over murdered American journalist James Foley was reported to have a London accent. Over a thousand British Muslims are now fighting for the Islamic State, and more are joining every day. The key thing to realize about British fighters in Syria is that they're not there to take a backseat role. They are very much at the forefront of this conflict. Britain is now a major exporter of terrorists, the result of multiculturalism. There have been warning signs for years. This was a Muslim protest in London CBN News brought to viewers more than eight years ago. Today, Britain has functioning Sharia courts, and Sharia patrols enforce Islamic law on some of its streets. Remove yourself away from the mosque. Go away from the mosque now. Muslim, area. Muslim patrol. It's a Muslim area. Are you not wanted around here? Islamic halal food is everywhere, and Islam is today the fastest growing religion in the UK. I actually gave up a modeling career for Islam, and I am happy. It's the best choice I've made ever. <laughs> Even though Muslims are a relatively small minority in Britain, there is a feeling among some British that their nation is being handed over to Islam that the government doesn't care about promoting traditional British values, Judeo-Christian values, either because it doesn't believe in them anymore or because it doesn't want to be labeled as intolerant. British civilization has been a gift to the world, but the British don't care so much about their own civilization anymore, and it's into this vacuum that Islam is advancing. Sure, the British still care about their queen and tradition, but radical Muslims have been allowed and even encouraged to build a parallel society within this officially Christian nation. The reason we have capitulated in the West so much to Islam is self-hatred. There's an underlying self-hatred of our own societies, of our own cultures. Anne-Marie Waters is a former leftist who runs Sharia Watch UK. We've got this multiculturalism, this dangerous multiculturalism in Britain, which is killing women, killing girls, and the left not only doesn't say anything about it, but continues to push for it as a good, even though it knows, even though it can see that it's killing girls. We know for a fact that there are mosques in this country where little girls of eight, nine, ten years of age are being married, uh, quote unquote married, to older men and, and being raped. When British soldier Lee Rigby was decapitated in the streets of London, one of the first things Prime Minister David Cameron said was that the murder was not because of Islam. After the Foley decapitation, Cameron said it again. And to be sure, many British Muslims have condemned the murder. As a Muslim, you know, I, I feel it's, it's, we shouldn't do it. I think it's disgusting. I think that a lot of extremists have taken over and hijacked Islam. We come back to this, it's only a tiny minority of extremists, it's got nothing to do with Islam, but the point is, this stuff is coming directly from the Quran, from the Hadith. Muslim immigrant sex grooming gangs were covered up by the British police for 20 years. The British government's weak response to radical Islam has led to the formation of citizen groups and protest movements, like the English Defence League and Britain First. Britain first goes into the street to confront Sharia patrols and has horrified the British establishment for having the nerve to go into mosque to pass out Bibles to Muslims. And now, there's a nice British Army Bible. Spread the word of Jesus Christ around Bradford. Amen. Jesus Christ our Lord, we want to save you from hell. We need to reject the false prophet Muhammad and read the Bible. The chairman of Britain First is Paul Golding. This is a Christian country. Our heritage is Christian. Uh, we take it very seriously. We hold it dear. Um, so giving out Christian Bibles in a Christian country on British streets to people who are British citizens, we don't see anything wrong with that. Is there, have you looked around for any threats at all? But when we were with Golding, he was dodging the police, who seemed to view him as a troublemaker. The British government is going to have to decide whether it cares more about being viewed as tolerant or about stopping terrorism, because the whole world is now paying the bill for Britain's experiment in multiculturalism. Um, and we have got to start dealing with this. We've got to say, look, we have freedom of speech. You can't beat up women. We won't stone people to death for their sex lives. You have to accept that or you can't live here. Dale Hurd, CBN News, London.
Our CBN News terrorism analyst, Eric Stackelback, is here with us. Eric, thanks, thanks for joining us. Gordon, great to be with you. Well, Britain just raised the terror threat to severe and is also trying to say now we want to fight radicalism there and abroad. Is, is that enough? Do you think this is enough to, to stop this? Gordon, my big worry about Britain is this may be too little too late. If you remember, what, nine years ago, the 7-7 bombing, July 7, 2005, where over 50 Brits were killed in these multiple subway and bus bombings in London, Tony Blair, then British Prime Minister, said, hey, we're going to get tough on extremism now. This is it. We're taking on the radicals. Well, this is nine years later, and the threat today, I would argue, Gordon, is even worse in Britain than it was in 2005. The Brits have done nothing to stop the massive flow of Muslim immigration. Immigration's one thing, but the Muslims who are coming to Britain in large numbers, and Gordon, I've been there on the ground. I've seen it with my own two eyes. I've interviewed radical imams in London. We've seen it on CBS. CBN News, they're not assimilating, and as Dale said in his piece, they are forming parallel societies. Even in East London, in the shadow of London's financial district, I have walked the streets. I have seen buildings, literally, Gordon, that have signs outside that say Sharia Court. It may be too far down the road right now for Britain to really get a handle on this. Well, it's, it's almost like they were asleep at the switch. I mean, what? Why would you allow a, a separate culture to, to form that's, that's intent on changing you? Uh, you know, we've, we've even heard of the joke, they're trying to make it London stand. Um, wh why would they allow that to continue? You know, Gordon, this goes back to the 1980s, if you can believe it. Now, back in the 80s, and I've talked to terrorism experts, analysts in London who have laid this out for me. Back in the 1980s, the British government basically made a deal with the devil, where they let all of these asylum seekers from places like Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Syria, guys who were wanted for terrorism in their home countries, the Brits allowed them to relocate to Great Britain and to set up shop. And what they had, Gordon, was basically an unspoken agreement. If you don't strike us here on British soil, we'll let you live here. Well, that all changed, obviously, on 7-7, nine years ago with the bombings then. And today, it's almost like a game of whack-a-mole, Gordon, where the Brits nearly every day are breaking up a new terror plot, and the next day, another one emerges. Why they let this happen is beyond me. I can tell you that Great Britain, there is a rampant political correctness there, number one. Number two, Christianity in Great Britain, which is a place, Gordon, as you know, where the gospel went out for years. Christianity in Britain has been severely weakened. And I can tell you, the waves of Muslim immigrants who are coming to Britain's shores have religious zeal, a clear goal, and a clear ideology. They know exactly what they want and exactly what they're fighting for, and that is Sharia law in the UK. Well, let's turn our attention to America now. Two of the ISIS fighters, uh, to my amazement, were from Minnesota. Uh, are, are we becoming uh, the new Britain here? Are, are, are we becoming a new pocket for radical Islam? There's a great chance of that. And Gordon, I, I look to Britain and I look to Europe as almost a harbinger, a cautionary tale of what could come here to the United States. We see a few things that remind me of the situation in Britain. Number one, we have the growth of mosques in the United States, and not just mosques, but radical mosques with a radical ideology and radical imams. I've been in these mosques, Gordon. I've reported for them on CBN News. It's a dangerous thing. Number two, we have areas in the United States, in Chicago, Dearborn, Michigan, New York City, where large Muslim immigrant communities are setting up almost parallel societies, like we saw in Great Britain. That's a major concern of mine. And the radicalization, which you just mentioned in Minnesota, at least a dozen residents of the Twin Cities areas, this is the Midwest of the United States, have traveled to Syria to join ISIS. Even worse than that, Gordon, dozens and dozens of Somali immigrants in Minneapolis. People might not realize, Minneapolis, of all places, has the largest Somali Muslim population in the United States. Dozens of young Somalis have traveled back home to Somalia to join al-Qaeda-linked groups there. And here's the rub, Gordon. They are going to return home one day. That's the problem. These are U.S. citizens, U.S. passport holders. One day after they're done training and battling with al-Qaeda, ISIS, 
they're going to come back here. And when they come back, they're not going to go back to school and get their bachelor's degree or get a job at a gas station. They're going to come back here and they're going to set up cells. That's what they will be directed to do and trained to do by the likes of Al Qaeda and ISIS. And my fear is eventually it's going to bite us here. What, what is it about Islam that creates this? Uh, you don't hear about United Methodist Jihad. <laughs> But here yes. you see, and it, and it seems to morph, and whether you call it Muslim Brotherhood or ISIS or Al-Qaeda, it, it seems to morph and, and, and literally sprout up this kind of terror activity uh, on its own. What is it about Islam that does this? I think there's a few things, Gordon. I think, number one, the Quran and the Hadiths, Islam's core texts, like it or not, are littered with calls to violence. That's indisputable. Muslims will tell you, yes, there are very violent verses in the Quran, but look, they were just meant for the seventh century. They were meant for Muhammad's day. They're not applicable today. Well, guess what? The majority of Muslims in the world today believe that those calls to jihad are open-ended and that they are applicable today. Number two, I think the example of Muhammad. Muhammad himself, and Muslims will tell you this, was a warrior was a political leader, was a conqueror. That's indisputable. Number three, the history of Islam, both current and older, is a history of conquest by the sword. These are indisputable facts. So I think when you combine all those things, you have the situation that we have today. But I think at the end of the day, the radicals, the jihadists, they can point to the Quran and the Hadiths, and they have a very compelling theological case that what they're doing is what Islam calls them to do. We're coming up on the anniversary of 9-11, and uh, I keep hearing there's a lot of chatter out there. I keep hearing that they're missing commercial airliners. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what are you hearing? I'm hearing the same thing. And one thing I'm hearing, Gordon, remember Al-Qaeda. Remember the guys who struck us on 9-11? They've been overshadowed recently by ISIS. Well, Al-Qaeda wants to get back in the game. There's kind of a competition right now going on between Al-Qaeda and ISIS for especially young recruits. Now, in the world of jihad, Gordon, it's a kind of a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately kind of world. Well, Al-Qaeda hasn't done all that much lately. ISIS is conquering vast amounts of territory in the heart of the Middle East. Al-Qaeda has been mainly silent. There's a concern that Al-Qaeda, because of that, is going to try to make a splash and become relevant again. Now, Al-Qaeda has an official glossy magazine, and in the recent issue, Gordon, they levied threats against Las Vegas and against military targets here in the U.S. So, number one, there's absolutely an eye on Al-Qaeda, what they're going to do. And number two, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, all jihadists have threatened U.S. embassies and consulates around the world. Remember Benghazi, the other 9-11 anniversary, September 11, 2012, when our consulate in Benghazi was sacked by Islamic terrorists, our ambassador killed. That is another threat. And number three, Gordon, that poorest southern border is a major concern for U.S. intelligence. And a big concern is that the likes of ISIS will utilize that border. It is wide open and enter the U.S. and set up a cell here to strike. Well, lots of reasons to stay awake at night and pray and pray for the protection of America. If you Excellent. want to know more on this subject, make sure to watch Eric's television show. It's called The Watchman. It's available through CBNNews.com. His latest book is called The Brotherhood, which is available in stores nationwide. It's Eric, thank you for being with us and thank, for, thank you for all you do to keep us aware of these things. Thank you, Gordon.